Hey everybody, Darren from the White Hatter, and in today's Thinkable Thursday, we're going to be talking with Commissioner Julie Inman Grant, and she is the e-safety commissioner with the Office of e-safety in Australia. Today, we have Commissioner Julie Inman Grant, and she is with the Office of the E-Safety Commissioner, and guess what? She is from Australia. She is from Australia. So let's bring her into the, uh, into the screen. Good morning, Commissioner. It's, I think it's 8 o'clock your time in Australia. It's 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on the west coast of Canada. Uh, how are you this morning? Good, thanks. I know no time zones. And uh, just because your listeners might sound confused, um, I am originally from Seattle, Washington, but I've spent the past 20 years here. Um, grew up with Hockey Night in Canada, you'll be pleased to know, and went to um, Boston University, which was a big hockey school. Yes. Thanks to the Canadians, we won some championships. <laughs> and cause, because you're from Seattle, I guess you've been up to Victoria, where we're located a couple times? Oh, yeah, on the Princess Marguerite. Um, although I don't think anybody's going to be taking any cruise ships. No. Yeah, the Princess Marguerite is a long time. We've got the clipper now, as you <laughs> probably know, that goes back and forth. But uh, you're now in Australia, so I understand you have dual citizenship now. You're, uh, you're, you have Australian and American citizenship. So welcome to the Commonwealth, I'd like to say to you. Thank so you. Maybe, I've enjoyed it. Maybe you can share with everybody about who you are. Uh, how did you find yourself in Australia, considering you're from the U.S., and a little bit about what your office does? Sure. Um, gosh, I could, I could fill up the f whole podcast. Um, but the short form story is um, I got my start in government in Washington, D.C., working for my hometown congressman um, back in the early 90s. And I was working on social issues. Mm -hmm. And he said, hey, we've got this small little software company in our district. I was wondering if you could do technology and telecommunications as well. So before there was an Internet, I started working at the intersection of social policy, technology and um, and safety and so mm -hmm. i was recruited as one of microsoft's first government relations professionals in dc back in 95 before the antitrust case happened so right. was there building their uh, washington dc presence and you've seen um, a wash rinse repeat cycle um, where once companies are either about to be in trouble with the government or they mature their functions, they set up a Washington DC office. Mm -hmm. So as you can imagine, after five years, it was an exhausting um, time, um, you know, representing Microsoft under those circumstances. But you know, a lot of key issues that we're talking about now, um, skilled immigration, encryption, online safety, the Communications Decency Act of 1996 was something that I worked on. And of course, they're talking about ratcheting back Section 230. So everything that's old is new again, um, or else I guess you'd say in, in the technology world, even though technology will always outpace policy, um, a lot of the issues are the same and will remain the same. Um, so anyway, they sent me off to Australia. Um, and uh, after 17 years with Microsoft, I spent a couple of years with Twitter. And that was a really um, enlightening um, experience. Um, and then at Adobe. Um, and uh, in night, and sorry, in 2015, the government decided, um, like, maybe I'll take a step back. In 2014, when I was at Twitter, um, I don't know if you've got the show Canadians, the Canadian Next Top Model. Yes. Well, we had a we have an Austra we had an Australian's Next Top Model, and the compare um, was a beautiful woman uh, who had very visible struggles with um, depression and mm -hmm. mental health issues. Mm -hmm. She was brutally trolled on Twitter. Um, she went off, she had a nervous breakdown, she came back on, uh, was brutally trolled further, and sadly ended up committing suicide. Mm. Um, and so it was known as the Twitter suicide, just as I was coming in trying to help them turn around their trust and safety fortunes. Mm -hmm. but, but a petition started, and people were angry, and they said to the Australian government, you need to do something about this. You need to regulate social media. You need to regulate the internet. And so what they decided to do was um, form an 
Children's East Safety Commissioner office, and that was um, held by um, another man for the first nine months. Um, and then uh, he moved on to another role, and uh, I took on this role in January 2017. So our overall goal is to make sure that all Australians have safer, more positive experiences online. We um, are a regulator, uh, but we sort of take a multifaceted approach. Um, there's obviously a huge prevention piece, and I know, Darren, that's where you really focused. We don't want the harms happening in the first place. Mm -hmm. So we've got internal research. We need to make sure everything's evidence-based, including the way we deliver messages. And so um, one of the programs that we have here is something called the Trusted E-Safety Provider Program, because there are a lot of people that do go out into the schools and talk to parents, mm -hmm. carers, educators, and kids about online safety, but not everybody's using the right pedagogy. You know, mm -hmm. might be using fear-based messages that we know don't work, or doing one-off presentations that, that don't have impact. So really, really um, understanding what causes behavioral change and positive behavioral change. Mm -hmm. Then we've got protection. Um, so I've got an investigative team of about 30, and uh, we've got a number of different regulatory schemes. One involves um, taking down harmful content for children who are being seriously cyberbullied. Um, and interestingly, we get more adult cyber abuse reports than we do youth-based cyberbullying. Um, we do not have any formal powers for that yet. And we can talk about some of those key differences. Um, we have an image-based abuse scheme. So intimate images and videos that are shared without consent. Uh, we've got about a 90% success rate in terms of getting um, this content down. Uh, we've seen a 200% surge in image-based re abuse reports since lockdown. And then we've got the cyber report team, which is um, Australia's hotline. Um, uh, our sister organization is the Canadian Center for Child Protection, and uh, we're working with them on um, Arachnid and the incredible work that they're doing. They're really a guiding light um, in the hotline space, that's for sure. Um, and um, so we not only uh, take down child sexual abuse material, but we have new powers around abhorrent violent material. So in the wake of the Christchurch massacre, any content that is captured um, by a perpetrator or an accomplice of a, a terrorist act or an act of torture, murder, or rape that is put online um, for to, to further incite hatred and rape, um, we can we, can, we have a very stringent notification scheme uh, where we can ask for takedown. We can also compel our ISPs to block that content if we think it's going viral. Now, am I correct that Australia is basically the leader in this field? You're the first government to form an actual office like yours to do what it is you do? Yeah, we are kind of the lone wolf on the scene right now. And um, yeah. Why? That, that is why, do you, why do you think that other countries, because I'll be honest with you, you guys are brilliant in what it is that you're doing. I say that to every politician I have an opportunity to talk to, both in Canada and the United States. I mean, why do you think it's it's such a challenge that these other countries aren't aren't doing the same thing? Because I, I like I say, I think what you're doing is brilliant. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, I expect over the next five or 10 years, there will be a network of, of regulators like the e-safety commissioner. Uh, I hope that's the case. Uh, Fiji has sent up a small commission um, and I, I've spoken to officials in Ireland. Uh, they're looking at setting up a digital safety commissioner. Of course, the UK um, is looking at online harms legislation and will eventually set up a regulator. But um, what about know, Canada? I, what about Canada? Please tell me you're talking to somebody funny. from here. I met uh, your former minister Goodall yeah. um, at one of the Five Eyes meetings, and and I know there are a number of Canadians that have talked to him about it. Uh, I think he's he's since moved on, and you may have new leadership. But uh, um, I'm well, happy I'm to light come a fire. to Ottawa at some point and 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 you know talk to the government about what we do because it does really help to have. Um, an organization like this that's focused and that can bring everyone together, can coordinate efforts so we can work across the NGO sector, with law enforcement, with with the people who are training. And what we've 
we've tried to do is build a community of practice well, so I, that yeah, I couldn't agree more it's kind of like the five eyes approach from a civilian standpoint right to, to deal with this for sure so trust me I'm writing letters and emails and stuff to our government because I think that we should be taking on and modeling what it is you like why we create the wheel you guys have done it you've learned what works what doesn't work and I think uh, we as a country I'm speaking for Canada right now I think we could go a long way in committing our in creating an office just like yours so why don't we start to get into the questions so first question I have for you commissioner um, is uh, what was the catalyst to create your office in Australia and what are your objectives and do you see other countries falling your lead we kind of talked about this a little bit but maybe you can build upon that just a little bit more for sure. us Sure. I guess um, what I would say is, um, you know, it, it's it's been a real journey um, since I um, I started this role in January uh, 2017. As I said, we started out as the Children's e Safety Commissioner, but within six months, uh, I think the government sort of saw that we were doing things well and we were having an impact. And they started with Children First because nobody can disagree um, where regulation is concerned that children aren't vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but as our um, successes, I guess, increased, we were given more to do in terms of regulatory schemes, but also in terms of programs. So um, we have a program, for instance, called Be Connected, which is for senior citizens mm -hmm. and the least represented population online in Australia. And I assume it's, it's it the is. same in Canada are our senior citizens over the age of 65. Mm -hmm. Um, now more than ever, with um, COVID lockdown, um, we know that um, technology can be a good connector um, and we it, it can help with issues of social isolation, access to government services, online banking, online shopping, all these things, um, connecting with family. Um, you know, really important skills to have. And um, so we have a, um, a program specifically for senior seniors um, to teach them the very basics because the 65 and over co cohort, um, there's a large proportion that have um, very low digital literacy skills. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's available to anybody who wants to go to our website, esafety.gov.au. One more time uh, for the site for all our listeners. What is it? esafety.gov.au. I have it bookmarked. <laughs> We've got um, programs for women who are experiencing domestic and family violence or what we now call violence against women, because in 98% of cases of domestic and family abuse, technology facilitated abuse is an extension of that control, harassment, surveillance. And we're going to talk about that a little later. So let's not drill too deep into that okay. one for sure. All right. uh, but is there anything else? Um, I, I would just say uh, we talked about prevention and then protection, getting the harmful content down when it's there. We also have a couple of programs of, of what I call proactive change. So we don't want to sit around playing a game of whack-a-mole um, for the rest of our lives in terms of responding after harms have been done. And we know that behavioral change through prevention programs, it, this is going to take years. Mm -hmm. This is going, We're probably all at least 10 years behind. So proactive change in is things like um, we've got an, um, a technology trends and challenges series. Uh, we just put one out yesterday on doxing. Um, we've done some on end-to-end -end encryption, on deep fakes. So technology trends that are emerging, how can this technology be harnessed for good? Um, but what are the risks that people need to know about? And um, we do a lot of this work so that we can figure out how to make our programs um, future proof of programs, um, but also provide our investigators to know, you know, how AI might be used to create deep, deep fakes and image based abuse photos. And just for and those then, just for those people who are watching, can you just um, uh, describe what a deep fake is? I know what it is, but maybe some of our people who are viewing don't know what a deep fake is. Um, well, deep fake is um, a use of AI. If I think of a very advanced um, form of Photoshop um, where what we've really seen is um, AI and deep fakes when there are multiple pictures. So a lot of celebrities have had their faces 
um, merged onto a porn star's body, for instance. But it isn't, the technology is getting so good, it isn't always detectable to the human eye. Mm -hmm. So you can see deep fakes uh, being created in terms of um, voice, you know, copying uh, Barack Obama's voice, um, um, merging two people. And so there, there's, I guess, some fun manifestations of that, but there's a lot of abuse that can happen. Um, you know, and the other example of the deep fake was the, was the uh, Nancy Pelosi um, yeah. image. So I, what scares me about that is the weaponization of it, you know, and, and how easy it can be weaponized and how to treat misinformation and disinformation from completely false information, right? And that's what's scary about the AI. So, uh, which kind of segues nicely into the next question I have for you, which is, you know, I love the fact that the eSafety office has an online portal for Australians who can connect directly with the government to report online concerns. What are some of the issues that Australians can report to your office and how are these reports dealt with by your office? Like you said, you have 60 invest or 30 investigators, I think you said. So uh, I'd like to drill down a little bit more on, on this question. So let's hear. Sure. Well, um you know, if you go to esafety.gov.au, we just spent about 18 months totally rebuilding the site. I often say that because we're we're only about five years old and we're a very small agency in government terms, um, we're not a hugely well-funded agency. Um, so only about 30% of Australians still know we exist. Mm. Uh, so I often talk about our website being the window to our soul. That's that's often the primary interface we have with our citizens. So we need it to be engaging. Um, we need it to be navigable. We need it to be useful. So if you go right onto the homepage, you see um, report abuse. And so uh, you can, we, we technically have six regulatory schemes, but you can, you can report uh, youth-based cyberbullying. You can report um, adult cyber abuse. Again, we only have informal powers, but we try and help people um, where we can. Um, and then we've got some programs like WITS. So um, that's Women Influencing Technology Spaces. Um, girls and women are disproportionately targeted in uh, terms of so forms of online abuse. Um, and then when you look at other um, intersectional factors, um, like um, in our indigenous people, um, those identifying as LGBTQI um, or those with a disability, mm -hmm. um, the instance of online harassment and abuse uh, is much higher um, for those. Um, actually, I was just watching Justin Trudeau uh, yesterday and his very um, powerful 20, 21 second um, speech, but he talked about Canadians being racialized and I'd never had heard that uh, terminology before. Mm -hmm. um, but that I'm sure you see that in Canada as well. Um, yeah. All abuse is intersectional and social media abuse often surfaces the reality of the human condition, whether it's misogyny or racism or prejudice. Um, you know, we all see this playing, playing out online. Yeah. So. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and so next question for you is, can you please share with everyone what is safety by design and why has this become such an important platform for you and your office to champion? I mean, if there's one thing that I've noticed over the past year and a bit of following you now on Twitter uh, is that you're really kind of leading the charge on this one. So fill us in a little bit more on why this is so uh, important for you. Maybe the, it, I wouldn't describe it as a, a grudge, but um, in my many years working at Microsoft in safety, uh, alongside my security and privacy brethren, um, online safety was often the kind of the, the forgotten stepchild. Yep. And uh, security by design and privacy by design have been well inculcated processes uh, for a very long time, for, for over a decade with most companies. But um, again, safety was just looked at as a throwaway when indeed there are immense personal harms that can happen online to individuals when you create any kind of platform that includes social interaction. So I think about it this way in, in terms of a real life analogy. When we get into our cars, we expect that the brakes are going to work, the airbags are going to deploy, and uh, that the seat belts are going to constrain us if we're in an accident. Um, but these 
really actually are relatively new safety features. Uh, I don't know if you remember in the 1970s, those big bench seats where we'd, we'd sit in the front without any seat belts on. But, but that was legislated and regulated, and now it's guided by international standards. So they come, into, they come in cars as standard. Well, I believe that technology platforms, we have a long history. We know what all the uh, abuses are. And in fact, we're just sharing, uh, we're just actually building as part of phase two of safety by design. Um, I, I, we're documenting the range of online harms and how technology can be weaponized. So no technology company can say we didn't understand what the harms were. Mm -hmm. Those is a perfect example. Um, when Zoom bombing started happening, you know, the, the CEO said, oh, I'd never really thought about online harassment. And gosh, was Zoom impressive in terms of the way it scaled from, you know, 10 million customers in December to, to hosting almost 200 million a day. Yep. But that's where they fell down because they didn't mindfully build safety, privacy and security into the fundamental design of their product. But we see this repeating itself again and again so what we decided to do, having come from industry, I don't think this is something that you can regulate your way out of or arrest your way out of. We need to change the culture of how technology is designed, developed, and deployed and bring the, bring the industry along with us. So we're, we want to do it with them rather than to them. So we sat with, down with 60 different companies. We came up with a set of principles. Um, we spent about eight months consulting, taking in all the feedback we could, and that included from civil society and other government entities um, around the globe. And we arrived at a set of agreed to principles that, um, that Google, Facebook, Snap, Roblox, Twitter, and others have said they can sign off on. And there are three, sorry about the itch, the three specific areas. Um, you know, what, what are service provider responsibilities? Um, how do we ensure user autonomy and empowerment so that the burden doesn't always fall on the users? And then how can companies be more transparent and accountable? And um, so, yes, I've been championing, the, championing that because I think that's the only way we can really change the threat surface in the future is if companies are assessing the risk, they're engineering out misuse, they're building in protections at the get-go rather than retrofitting fixes after the damage has been done. I mean, too often now, we see companies responding to revenue, reputational, and regulatory risks, but not doing the right thing and using an ethical frame. You know, I think what I love about what you're doing is you're going to take the argument of willful blindness away from these uh big vendors because they can't be willfully blind anymore because of what it is that you're, you're now doing, right? Knowledge and the understanding and application of that knowledge is power. And I think if you combine that with the Section 230, if it's being re-looked at again, where potentially there could be some liability associated to some of these companies, they will have a really hard time from a, a litigation standpoint to uh, use blindness or willful blindness as a defense because you're going to be shining a light on it very, very clearly. Am I kind of reading this right? Well, you know, it's 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 interesting. Um, I'm, you know, my my style is to use as much carrot as possible um, before having to use the stick, and I do have significant regulatory powers. But what I can tell you is. Uh, where cyberbullying is concerned, when when we come to a company, one of the companies in our tier scheme, and that includes um, Snap, tip, TikTok, um, Google and Facebook didn't voluntarily join our scheme, um, but they do respond when we, we come to them and we say, uh, this young person reported this to you, you didn't take it down, we think it it fits the bill of seriously harassing, harassing, threatening, intimidating, or humiliating. This is the context behind it. This is why, so we're advocating on behalf of the, the person. There hasn't been a single case where any of those companies have said, well, no, we won't take it down. I, I can find them, um, you know, $250,000 on a daily basis, but that's not going to deter the big behemoths either. Yeah. They don't want this kind of toxicity on their platforms. Yeah, bad for um, business. It, it is bad for business, it's bad for trust, yeah. but they're still not, they're still not prioritizing it. 
Um, so what we're doing with phase two is uh, we've developed um, an internal assessment tool. So uh, basically, um, and we've had a lot of companies start to use it as an audit tool, asking basic questions like, do you have terms of service? Well, if you don't, here's a, you know, Xbox community standards are, are, a, gr are a great um, good practice. You, mm -hmm. you can learn, or you know, are you deploying photo DNA? Um, are, are, do you have a report abuse functionality? Are you using internal content moderation or will you be building a trust and safety team? So getting companies to mindfully think and do those risk assessments up front. And we're starting to work with uh, the investment community and the VC community because we believe they are an important lever. They're part of this ecosystem. But if they say to these founders and these bright new startups, hey, have you assessed have you assessed these things? We want to be investing ethically. We want to manage our own risks. We don't want you to become the next Saraha or Ask FM or Kick. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I had to throw a Canadian company in there. And so um, you should, right? <laughs> okay, but can you imagine if all the other big countries in the world were doing the same thing that you're doing as a government office, when all of a sudden there's now strength in numbers, or if all the other countries were doing what it is you're doing, it would put so much pressure on these huge vendors and combining that with, and again, uh, your approach, uh, iron fist, velvet glove, right? Approach to yeah. the stick, right? Um, I, I love that approach, but in the end, if it's not gonna cost them big money, then there's little impetus for some, not all, for some to change. So if all of a sudden that Section 230 is revisited and now we're coming together as countries around the world, I think we could effect some positive change. I'm actually quite excited to hear about what you're doing. Well, keep keep advocating because oh. I, I think that would be the best outcome as well. Uh, I, I mean, all of the sites we're going after are domiciled overseas. Yeah. These are global crimes that know no borders. We need to have people policing the borders and working together, as you say, strength in numbers. Yeah, for sure. Next question. So we have seen an anecdotal increase in tech-based facilitated violence against women, uh, us personally as a company. Have you in your office seen the same thing? And what are some of the other spikes that you have seen? Uh, yeah, we we have seen uh, we've got a program e safety women, uh, which includes a learning management system that uh, frontline workers, um, allied health workers, uh, former police can use if, if if they want to. And we've developed a special COVID domestic and family violence uh, and TFA uh, kit. Uh, as I indicated before, in 98% of the domestic and family violence cases, technology facilitated abuse is an extension um, of that um, mm -hmm. coercion and control. The vast majority that we see is low tech. So repeated harassing messages, uh, following, you know, surveilling through um, GPS settings, but surveillance devices put in, under prams and teddy bears, um, spyware on iPads and iPhones that they give to the kids. So using the kids to sort of surveil what mama's doing, um, you name it. But but we, we've seen some more sophisticated attacks as well. You know, the ex-husband um, programming a menacing message that comes up on the smart TV, controlling the thermostat uh, with a mobile remotely and turning it, it up to 40 degrees. But there was one woman whose car inexplicably stalled every time she went two kilometers beyond her home. Um, in, and cars are computers, yep. so drones over safe houses. So, um, you know, I guess in my tw almost 30 years now in the technology field, people can find endless creative ways to misuse technology. And so the challenge with building our program is we, we before COVID, we were doing face-to-face -face training and we reached about 10,000 frontline workers. Um, and we also have a site for women, but we don't we don't want um, perpetrators to get ideas or re reverse engineer mm -hmm. this guidance. But we want women and those supporting women to be able to help them use this technology safely. No, 
know how to, um, you know, what are the indications of spyware, um, know when to turn off GPS, you know, the um, know how to create um, clean emails, um, because we want technology in these cases to be used as a lifeline, mm -hmm. rather as rather than as a weapon for further abuse and debasement. And what we have seen over COVID too is um, a lot more people um, are seeking out our domestic violence um, information online. I mean, think about what this means for, pe for, for, for women and their children being trapped with their abusers um, mm. and being watched. So they can't make the call to the domestic violence hotline. So they are turning to electronic means. And if you go on our site, you'll see that we have a quick exit there. So if... Um, I don't know if you saw the project here in Canada by one of our groups here for women who are in abusive relationships at home and they can't say anything, but it's a hand signal now, which is very hard to see, which is if they're talking to a friend and they do this, hi, but do this and this, this means I need help. Wow, that so, just gave me chills. Yeah, so it's, and, and what's really cool is it doesn't create a digital trail. So it's it's very interesting that way right it's a huge initiative that was being pushed in canada right now and it's kind of making its way i mean ultimately the abuser is going to know about it but unless they can see uh the survivor i like to call them survivors and not victims if uh, but you, it's so easy now to hide a hand to do something like that but if a friend can see that they now know that that person needs help right so when when you said an increase in, in like we helped a family much like you where this individual was controlling the entire smart home including the car right and so we had to walk that person through how to prevent that from happening I know that you guys have a check sheet on your sh your site where you talk about this to help survivors who are leaving those types of relationships and we've done the same thing as well so but what did you say what was the increased percentage you've, you said in Australia Oh, um, well, we've we've just seen a, du a doubling of website traffic to wow. our e safety women's guide. Uh, we, and yeah. and it, we've we've seen with the domestic violence sector here, um, some states have seen huge increases in calls to domestic violence hotlines and some have had eerie silences. It's it's interesting to see that because I interviewed the chief of police here in Victoria for a Thinkable Thursday a couple of weeks ago and I asked him, have you seen, because anecdotally I've heard from some other chiefs across this country in the United States and even in Britain that they've seen a spike. And he said, you know what, Darren? None of the police departments in British Columbia have re are, are seeing that spike, which to me is interesting. It's it maybe it's not that it's not happening, but it's harder for these individuals maybe to reach out for help, right? And so that's Absolutely. why that's why this signal that was created by this group, I just I, I thought it was brilliant as a way to to, to to technology, which kind of segues really nicely into this question, which is yes, tech can be used as a weapon, but can you share with us how it can be used as a lifeline, kind of like using that hand signal that I talked yeah. about, right? What are some other ideas you have? Yeah, well, you know, again, I, I think um, we have to be balanced in the way we look at technology. Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, fear, uncertainty and doubt being spread. There are a lot of scams out there happening, but had the in internet and technology not been such an integral part of our lives, we wouldn't be able to connect. We wouldn't be able to remote learn, remote work, remote socialize, um, be entertained. Mm -hmm. Think of how much more painful um, our isolation uh, would be. Would be. So there are benefits, and I, you know, I personally believe that this has changed working and learning patterns so much. Um, that technology will continue to become an even larger factor in all of our lives and in terms of what we do. So it's here to stay. And my philosophy, I guess, is let's harness the benefits um, and minimize the risks. Um, you know, I technology brought you and I together, mm -hmm. Darren. And um, of course, this you know we don't talk about specific cases. Um, but I think your audience deserves to know what a, a caring, engaged human being you are. Um, he's reached out to me twice when um, a person has disclosed, a teenager has disclosed to him um, an Australian child who um, was threatening self-harm and suicide. And uh, we were able to take that information, go to the local police and have 
the police go um, check in on that that child um, twice. So that you know, it gives me chills because technology can connect us in in so many ways. And you know, you know I, thank I, you, Darren, I, for aver- averting harm. Well, and thank you for being there, right? Like it, it's amazing how through technology we're able to connect to help deal with the situation. But you know, one of the things I've been saying is you know through COVID nineteen we're we're physically distancing, but we're using technology to stay socially connected with one another. And the other thing that I've seen out of this, because out of the out of this will come a fiery phoenix, like I have no doubt about it. And I, you know, one of the things I've seen is I think this has really caused parents to pay a little bit more attention and to understand technology, right? Which is kind of cool. Like I, I had a parent who goes, you know what, Darren, I don't think I would ever want to play Fortnite with my kid, but I actually sat down because there was nothing else to do. And I, I actually love it, right? It's giving parents a better insight. And for the kids, I think it's also showing kids that that there's more to technology, there's more to the world than just technology as well. Like, I'll be honest, during COVID-19, when I go out for a walk, I've never seen as many kids on the street playing, skipping rope, riding bicycles, on skateboards, walking with parents. I didn't see that pre-COVID, right? Like it's- Just it, like it, us back in the day. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting to see how, how COVID is, is, is having this, this, this effect on giving some better insight both ways. Because I agree with you, if this would have happened 20 years ago, can you imagine the emotional and psychological strain that would have been there? Because we're humans and humans love to connect, especially kids, right? And, and this has definitely given our kids and even parents the ability to stay socially connected while we physically just, that's why I never ever called it social distancing when they first came out with that term, because I said, no, it's not. It's physical distancing, right? And we're staying socially connected through the use of social media, which um, I think is really cool. But here's here's the next question. Again, thank you for that shout out. I appreciate it, Commissioner. Um, next question I have for you. I think too often parents believe that youth are up to all this mischief when they are online, when in fact most are doing super uber cool things. And we adults should be acknowledging this fact. What apps are you seeing youth turning to to stay socially connected in a positive way while they physically separate to help stop the spread of COVID-19? You know, this is an important question to me because when I do my parents' education, it's amazing how many of them think that these kids are up to all this horrible, evil mischief when in fact, no, they're not. They're doing super uber cool things and we older adults and parents and caregivers need to start acknowledging that fact. Yeah, there's a small percentage that aren't. We need to talk about them, but I think what we're seeing the kids doing right now is spectacular. And I I just want to kind of drill down a little bit on this with you to hear what you're seeing from the kids and stuff. So let's hear some thoughts. Well, I just want to reflect on um, that last segment. And we've been saying for a long time that the best parental controls are parental presence. And the minute you hand over your technology, you should start um, the conversation of, about what I call the four R's. So back in our day, it was um, reading, writing, and arithmetic. But the skills that our young people need today for the digital age are around respect, responsibility, building digital resilience, and critical reasoning skills. And because 81% of Australian parents are giving kids access to an internet-enabled device by the time they're four years old, that education does have to start um, in the home. So we do now have an um, zero to four um, program um, because kids are, 42% are, are, are on a device by the time they're two years old. So that engagement that you were talking about, being engaged in your kids' online lives, the way that you are their everyday lives is key. And that's where you know, COVID-19, I think, has presented us an opportunity to, you know, we we were having dinner with our kids and we weren't able to ask what they did at school or or in sport it's really what are you doing online i have my my 14 year old um came into me last night and she said um you know i'm kind of a voyeur online i let everybody else um debate but i want to make a statement about george george floyd and um about all lives mattering and racism. And she actually sat down and she said, this is what I wrote. And uh, we kind of workshopped it to to make sure I'm like, well, you know, so we were able to kind of talk about the issues. It became a conversation starter um, when usually it's the other way around. What are you doing, who you're talking to? So, you know, kids are using Snap, they're using TikTok, they're using Instagram, Um, they are, legends. Um, 
you know, and it's really interesting, the schism that kind of exists between parents and kids. Um, you know, 95% of parents here consider online safety a perennial parenting challenge, you know, a challenge that our parents didn't have, yet they don't know where to go for help. And yeah. they feel, they almost feel intimidated by their child because they have more technological mastery. I mean, I watch my twins play Roblox and Minecraft. I'm like, how do you do that? Yeah. But we forget that we have the judgment, the life experience, the maturity, the resilience that they don't have. So we don't need to have that technological mastery to be able to have these important conversations about making good choices and coming to us if things go wrong. Yeah, and a couple comments on that. I mean, the good evidence-based research is now showing us that parents and kids that integrate with one another in the on life world. And I like to call it the on life. I'm trying to, you know, to me, semantics are important, right? Like because our kids today don't see a difference between the online world and the digital world. To them, it's just one world. We adults, us boomers do, right? Us boomers do, but not the kids. And an academic at a university in the United States a couple of years ago, he coined the term on life. And so that's why, that's, that's what I'm now using. So rather than saying digital literacy, I'm saying on life literacy. Because when you think about it, literacy is literacy. It doesn't matter if it's on or offline, it's literacy, right? So that's right. kind of why I'm using, but the research now shows us that parents who engage their kids in the on life world, those kids are far less likely to get themselves involved in less desirable behavior online. But if there's one thing I've heard from the kids, you know, we've presented to just over, just close to half a million of them now, and here's what they said to me. You know what, Darren, we try to teach our parents about this stuff, but they have no patience. They have no patience. So, and, and the reason is, is because we parents, when we learn, it's A, B, C, D, E, very linear, right? Where when the kids teach, it's A, B, Q, M, Z, W, T. And it drives <laughs> parents crazy. So one of the things they say to parents is, give your kids a little bit of patience. Because if you do that, you'll be amazed at what it is you learn. Like, like you, everything I share, I learned from Brandon, our son. He was my digital Jedi master. I was his digital <laughs> Padawan. Right, him and I fight back and forth now. Who the who the master is? He is truly my master. But again, it came down to being patient with your kids and engaging. And and I think COVID has kind of forced that to a point because, like it or not, parents are now locked in the same house with their kids who are on the technology, which is kind of forcing them to see that insight. Because again. One of the challenges that we faced is parental abdication. Like when we do kids, thousands of kids attend. When I do a parent, you know, I'd be lucky to get 20 parents showing up, right? Because of parental abdication. But I think COVID has kind of changed that equation a little bit where parents are getting a little bit more engaged in understanding. Thoughts, comments? Uh, no, I, I, I'd absolutely agree um, that parents by necessity are getting engaged and for a long time. So again, I try and... I try and be pragmatic in terms of the guidance we give. I mean, we see the worst of the worst online. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure you're seeing the same thing around um, what we call coerced, self-produced child sexual abuse material. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the remote luring um, uh, by, by predators of young people to in, engage in online acts, um, often online sex acts. And of course, we, we see videos where this is happening and you can hear the parents' voices in the next room. So one of the key pieces of advice we, we've been giving people for a long time, parents for a long time, but um, particularly now is, you know, don't, don't allow the children to use the technology in the bedrooms and the bathrooms. They should be out in the open areas when it's not you know, mm -hmm. not for schooling. And of course, you know, when they're online learning, they're of course texting while they're doing that sort of thing. But, but, you know, I, I, I said to my own teenager, like, why can't I, why can't I have my phone in my room? I'm like, well, my mom um, knew when I had somebody over that no good was going to happen if I was in my bed, the bedroom with the door closed. It's, the, it's the same thing. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that we've seen a spike in anecdotally is the exploitation online of those under the age of 13. I mean, they become real targets. We just did a webinar on this. In fact, one of your PhDs in Australia who consults with your office attended the PhD. It attended our presentation and she said, you know, I, I thought I knew a lot about it, but after listening to you, I learned a lot more, uh, which is really important. And we're actually bringing that webinar back by popular demand again because it was so well attended. We've had some more, but it's, it's an issue. I mean, some of the peer reviewed research, I don't know if you've seen this, but prior to COVID-19, the last research was about 2018. It found that about 12% of teens between the ages of 12 to 16 years of age fell, fell 
victim to online predation, right? So it, you know, because a lot of parents think that this is out of control, like it's at epic, and it's not. It's a reality and something we need to be alive to, but especially for those under the age of 13, right? Uh, and understanding the lures and the, the grooming process is really important for sure, which kind of segues really nicely into this next question I have for you. You know, what I really respect about you and your office is that is the fact that you turn to evidence-based research. Why is this so important when it comes to online, uh, on life literacy? And I'll be honest with you, you know, Brandon, because he's got his master's and I think about his PhD now, he was the one who brought evidence-based research to this company and I'm so thankful that he did right because we were using a lot of anecdotal stuff which to a degree is important right don't get me wrong but he really brought the whole evidence-based research approach to what it is that we teach and how we teach so I'd like to hear your thoughts on this and this is what I really respect about your office right I truly do I I, I mean I, I don't think I'm dispensing responsible information if I'm just going on anecdote or feeding people's fears. So evidence-based research is critical. And, um, you know, a lot, we don't have a playbook. Um, we don't have um, another, you know, office like this to follow. So I'm making it up as I go along. If I'm gonna make this up as I go along, I'm gonna base it on as much experience as I have and the experience of my staff in terms of what we see, mm -hmm. but that all has to be bolstered with um, research. And so for instance, um, the first thing I did when I started this, I started this gig, it was announced I was going to be launching the revenge porn portal. And I said, no, it isn't, because I'm not going to call it revenge porn portal. <laughs> revenge for what? We don't want this to lead to victim blaming. Yeah. This isn't this isn't about the act of sharing the intimate images, you know, sensibly with someone you love. It's about the non-consensual sharing of it. That's what should be um, criticized. Um, but to to even know what to build in terms of um, creating that information and creating a regulatory scheme that was going to be useful for, for people, we needed both quantitative and qualitative research. We, we needed to know what the prevalence was. And because we have that baseline from almost four years ago, you know, we've seen sadly that um, the, the prevalence of image-based abuse has increased. So we know that one in 10 of Australians four years ago has experienced it. It's now closer to one in five. And for now, does that include adults in those numbers or is that simply teens that you're talking about? Like, what are you talking about? Uh, we're, during the we're talking about adults. Adults, okay. Um, about 30% of the reports that we get into our image-based abuse portal are from minors. But um, in many cases, that becomes child sexual abuse material. So right. that's why we have our, um, our cyberbullying team, our image-based abuse team, and our cyber report team uh, working side by side in a hotline space because there's a lot of uh, crossover between what is bullying content, what is image-based abuse, and what might might be considered right. child sexual abuse material. Mm. Very interesting uh, with respect to that. Next question I have for you is, you know, over the past year, we have now helped 19, six who were identified as male and three who identified as female and their families specific to the issue of problematic online pornography use. What do you think parents can do preventively to help cope with this clear and present threat to our kids? Well, I think most parents have no idea how extreme and violent uh, and gendered violence is um, in porn that's read readily accessible now. I often say, you know, this isn't the penthouse that your dad hid in his sock drawer. Um, this is really serious stuff. And, um, you know, in Australia, the average age, um, a young, young boys are accessing this is around seven or eight. So um, one of the things we have, again, this is about parental engagement, parental controls. I mean, it's not about filters. I often say the best filters that we have as parents are the filters between our children's ears, their brains. So, um, but it, it's about talking to them um, before they come across it, because it's not a matter of if, it's when. So we have some points about how to talk to your kids about um, online pornography. Um, before they're eight, between eight and 12, and then as teenagers, because they're very different um, conversations. Uh, 
we actually put an expert panel together in 2017 and um, wrote a 90 page paper with a series of 16 recommendations on how to deal uh, with online pornography. I think it's it's really hard. And of course, again, another thing for Canada to be proud of is you, you've got MindGeek uh, domiciled there in Quebec, I believe, um, mm-hmm. which is uh, the lar- largest pornography uh, yep. online site in the world. Um, so uh, a parliamentary inquiry has been done here on some recommendations were made about um, age verification. And uh, so the government's going, going to consider whether they'll take those forward. Um, it was pretty widely um, publicized that uh, the UK was going to move forward and the BBFC there did some tremendous groundwork in terms of getting that ready to uh, roll out age verification there. And um, a stop was put to that. Um, I, I'm sure they'll take it up again um, when they're able to. Uh, but. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we get a chance uh, to make that work. Yeah. Um, One of the things I say to parents is if we don't start talking to our kids about what the difference is between healthy human sexuality and pornography, you're leaving it to the porn industry to do it for you. And that is a recipe for disaster. It is amazing when I speak to doctors locally, anecdotally, how many of them are saying they're seeing an increase in sexually um, sexualized injuries taking place of teens right now, both those who identify male and female as a result of some of the acts that they're trying to perform on one another because they're seeing it on pornography and the objectification yep. of pornography and, you know, and how that is affecting, right? And so, but again, it's, you know, one of the things I hear parents say, how do I talk to my 12 year old about this topic? And much like you, we brought in a PhD and a family counselor who specialize in this area. And we spoke to him for about an hour and a half uh, to give parents some ideas on how to approach this and talk about this. Because you're fooling yourself to think that they're not uh, talking about it amongst themselves, especially boys and the pornography and what's going on uh, on those issues. So any further comments on that? I just say we, we're what's at risk is the future social, uh, sexual socialization of our children, yeah. really. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, you know, again, it, it probably should start in the home. It's yeah. it's an awkward conversation at the best of times, which is why we've uh, tried to put some conversation starters t- together. But it also needs to be taught in the schools. I agree. Through respectful relationships education, through sex education. You know, if this is the primary way that children are getting their sex education, which is probably happening too late, that's a that's a problem. I mean, it's a it's a sensitive, dicey area. It, it also means we need to teach teachers to be comfortable um, teaching that kind of content, because um, if the teachers aren't knowledgeable and passionate, it's not going to get through to the students. And one of the ways to do that is through a harm reduction approach based upon research, right? Use yep. the research on a harm reduction approach, which is so important. Next question. Uh, privacy is important to us, but the move to end end encryption by big social media vendors is concerning, especially when it comes to online sexual predation and exploitation. What are your thoughts on this issue? And is there a balance that can be achieved by meeting everyone's interest? Um, well, because this is such a complicated and nuanced issue as part of our new and emerging trends, I've, I've got a um, position paper, which I think is balanced and nuanced. You know, obviously, we need encryption and we need security and privacy, particularly for transactions. Um, but um, I very strongly feel that um, companies that are moving to end-to-end encryption um, and essentially creating a secondary dark web for the exploitation of our children um, and abdicating responsibility. Um, They shouldn't be moving to that world without having um, some clear, tangible steps that they're going to take to um, identify content. And there is AI on the edge. There are behavioral patterns. There are a range of things that can be done, Um, but I I don't think um, for a moment that companies should be taking the step and frankly there are companies like apple that you know have already encrypted this stuff and you know their focus is on privacy it shouldn't be at the expense of children um i I don't see this as as um, mutually exclusive we need to look at security privacy and safety and make sure we get the balance right i couldn't agree more You got a tight schedule, I'm gonna let you know. So I'm gonna close out here with everybody who's watching. So on behalf of the White Hatter team, I wanna thank the commissioner for uh, uh, partaking in today's uh, 
discussion on a variety of different topics. I just, it just, I really was looking forward to this one, and uh, I wasn't disappointed at all. So, on behalf of the White Hatter team, I want to thank the commissioner for uh, for attending our session, and we look forward to our next Thinkable Thursday. So, from the White Hatter team, see ya. <laughs>